health and other factors, but it could be that for every dollar you invest in your life insurance, your family could be paid five times that amount, tax-free, or even more in some cases. I do that all day long to fill up the tax-free safety zone, building tax-free wealth. It's the most direct route to tax-free territory, your destination, the sunshine and rainbows. That's exactly where you want to end up. Well, not really. It's not really where you want to end up because this happened because you were dead. <laughs> but with a special kind of life insurance, permanent insurance, you can have the best of both worlds, literally both worlds. You can use it while you're alive or leave it to grow tax-free for your family. With permanent insurance, the value goes here in your tax-free safety zone. If you need it, you have the key. You can withdraw what you need tax-free. If you don't need it, your family gets the tax-free windfall. Life insurance can also be invaluable if you have a large IRA and you're worried that your children might squander it when they inherit it. How could that happen? <laughs> Clients always tell me, it's not my kids I worry about, it's the ones they marry. Do you think that too? Yeah. Don't look around, just saying. <laughs> you don't want to work your whole life and your savings ends up with someone you might not even know yet. Your child's inherited IRA could be one divorce away from being lost to an ex-spouse. Is that what you want? It could take you 40 years to build it up and take them 40 minutes to blow it. If you're worried about spending a lifetime saving only to have it disappear right after death or lost to children's creditors, divorces, lawsuits, bankruptcy, or bad financial decisions, remember those dangerous words, son-in-law, you can protect against that. You could name a trust as your IRA beneficiary and include restrictive provisions. The U.S. Supreme Court recently ruled that inherited IRAs are not protected in bankruptcy under federal law. So we're seeing more trusts being used to protect large IRAs. The trust works, but it's costly and complicated. There are still required minimum distributions to the trust each year. The trust has to be maintained. Specific tax rules have to be followed. Annual trust tax returns need to be prepared. And after all of that, depending on the trust, much of that inherited IRA could end up being lost to trust taxes, the highest tax rates in the land. Actually, the tax cost may outweigh the protection you want. Depending on the tax rates, you could be giving more to Uncle Sam than your children, all in an effort to protect it for them? So let me understand this. To make sure your children don't blow it, you'd rather give it to Uncle Sam. Really? That's not a good plan. This is another area where life insurance can be the answer and solve two big problems. The taxes and protecting your children from squandering your IRA money. In fact, life insurance can be much better for a beneficiary than an IRA. It eliminates all the complicated tax rules and the taxes. Instead of leaving your IRA to a trust, withdraw money now from your IRA, pay the tax, and use the remaining amount for life insurance. And then leave the life insurance to your trust. The life insurance is a much better asset to leave to a trust than an IRA. In fact, you could use less of your IRA to produce more life insurance, leaving more IRA funds for you to use in retirement if you need them. And unlike the IRA, the life insurance that gets paid to the trust is tax-free, and the trust can still protect your money from creditors or children blowing it. Think about it this way. Life insurance is an asset. It's tax-free. It doesn't get eroded. On the other hand, your IRA is a liability, a tax waiting to happen. It's not worth what you think it is because it hasn't been taxed yet. I know that not everyone qualifies for life insurance due to your age and health, but if you do qualify, don't wait until you don't. 
Start piling up your money in the tax-free safety zone as much as you can. Take it from IRAs or other taxable investments and stockpile it here through Roth conversions and life insurance. And do it now before taxes go up. Using only that money in retirement will lower your current taxes, lower your future taxes, and you'll be rid of your greedy, tax-hungry partner, Uncle Sam. No sharing anymore. Before we continue on our journey, let's pull over and address your Social Security options. The big question is when should you begin receiving your benefits? For most of you, later is better. However, everyone has different circumstances, so of course you should always run your own situation by your tax and financial advisors to see which option works best for you. As a general rule, though, consider delaying your Social Security benefits until age 70 if you can. You'll get more for the rest of your life, but only for life. If you die early, say at age 73, then obviously you would have received more if you began claiming your benefits earlier. But there's no way of knowing that. But even if you die early, if you have a spouse that survives you, they'll generally be able to get your benefit amount. All of this talk of death and dying. You know, I know an estate planning attorney who tells me all the time, never say death or talk about death. So I asked him, what do you call it? He said, I like to use the term when the will matures. <laughs> I call it what it is. When you're dead, you're dead. But even then, your social security can live on to your spouse. But what if you stopped working or you need money to live on until age 70? That's where your taxable IRAs come in, if you have them. It's true that you're not required to withdraw from your IRA until you reach age 70 and a half. But why wait? If you need money during your 60s, chances are you're in a lower tax bracket and this may be the perfect and least costly time to withdraw your IRA funds. Yes, taking IRA distributions can increase your current taxable income. But that's okay because you need the money. So the plan is to take your IRA distributions in your 60s and delay Social Security until age 70. This will allow you to get the most from all your retirement income sources and pay the least in taxes. You have most of the roadmap now, but the biggest bumps in the road may still be ahead. Let's make sure your roadmap is crash tested to avoid fatal tax mistakes. You'd hate to mess this up now. When you watch football, do you ever notice how the pace picks up frantically at the end of a game? Or even more in overtime when every point counts. And any mistake is magnified and could cost you the game. It's the same thing here in the second half of the retirement game. This is where all the taxes hit, and just like that football game, mistakes are magnified and could cost you the game. Here are the five biggest retirement roadblocks that can stop you from getting to the tax-free promised land. Number one, not taking care of yourself first. Number two, moving your IRA funds the wrong way. Number three, not checking beneficiary forms. Number four, not protecting your savings. And number five, working with the wrong financial advisor. Number one, not taking care of yourself first. You're heading into retirement, or maybe you're already there. When is it your time? I've given you a roadmap to a tax-free retirement, but there are still some of you who are bogged down with helping everyone else. That's retirement gridlock, and you don't have the time to wait it out. It's a dead end. There comes a point where you must come first, and that time is now. You have only so many years left to enjoy, and that shouldn't be put off because you're still worrying about everyone else. What about you? For example, helping kids or grandkids with college money. That's great if there's plenty to spare, but if it drains the money you put away for yourself, Who's going to replace it? Them? <laughs> they can get a loan for college, but you can't get a loan for your retirement. Helping children buy a house. They can get a mortgage for that, but you can't get a mortgage for retirement. 
Your priorities have to change now. You first. When you get on a plane before the flight takes off and after the mandatory one-hour air traffic control delay, <laughs> yeah, you know, the flight attendant goes through the safety instructions, right? And one of them is, if the oxygen mask comes down first, after you finish screaming and texting, <laughs> they tell you to first put the mask on yourself and then put the mask on the children you like the most, in that order. <laughs> they tell you this because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't be of help to anyone else. It's the same thing in retirement. This is your time. You spent a lifetime sacrificing. Retirement can be a long road. Some of you will spend more years in retirement than you spent working, and you need to plan for that. So you first, no detours for others from now on. Got it? Got it. Now to number two of the five biggest retirement roadblocks, moving your IRA funds the wrong way. Here's an IRA death trap you need to avoid. When you move your IRA money from one IRA to another, that's called an IRA rollover. And it's common, and that's fine. But be careful, very careful. Think of your IRA like an eggshell. You break it, and it's over. The rules are strict and unforgiving, and mistakes here are fatal. They can end your IRA. If you're using your car's GPS and you make a wrong turn, the nice lady comes on and says something like, no problem, recalculating. Mm -hmm. But with your IRA, there is no recalculating. If your IRA money is moved the wrong way, your entire IRA withdrawal, which you simply wanted to move to another bank, is now taxable plus a 10% penalty if you happen to be under 59 and a half, and the funds cannot be rolled over. You've lost your IRA. Gone. There are reasons to move your IRA from one financial institution or advisor to another. You might be changing advisors, <laughs> especially after watching this program and realizing how much you weren't told about IRA tax planning. Or you simply might want to change investments or combine your IRA funds. It's the way you move your IRA or Roth IRA funds that you need to be careful about. There are two ways to move your IRA money. One is directly and the other is indirectly. Always move your IRA funds directly if you can. A direct transfer, it's also called a trustee to trustee transfer, is when your IRA funds move directly from one IRA to another without you touching the money in between. You can do as many of these as you wish without worrying about something called the once per year IRA rollover rule. With the other method of rolling over IRA funds, an indirect transfer, also called a 60-day rollover, you get a check from your IRA made out to you personally, and then you have 60 days from the date you received it to redeposit that money, roll it over to another IRA. Avoid this indirect 60-day rollover like the plague. The problem with the 60-day rollover is that you only get one chance to do this within a year, and it's not a calendar year. It's 365 days or 12 months. If you accidentally attempt a second 60-day rollover within the 365 days, the funds withdrawn, which could be your entire IRA account balance, could be subject to tax and possibly a 10% penalty. They can't be rolled over. That could cause your tax rate to skyrocket, but worse, your IRA tax shelter is gone. Imagine losing a $500,000 IRA because you fell into this trap. That's what I call a wrong turn that could put a serious dent in your retirement plan. And to make things worse, this is a fatal error. It can't be fixed. It's over. There's no recalculating here. No nice lady. The rule only applies when you're moving your IRA money from one IRA to another IRA or from one Roth IRA to another Roth IRA. The rule is even stricter than it was in the past. For example, if you do a 60-day IRA rollover from one of your traditional IRAs to another, you can't do another 60-day rollover from any of your IRAs or Roth IRAs for the next 12 months. 
So why ask for trouble? Avoid this problem altogether. Always use direct trustee to trustee transfers when moving your IRA money. Now to number three of the five biggest retirement roadblocks. Here we go again, not checking beneficiary forms. Once again, I'll plead with you to update your IRA and plan beneficiary forms. I mention beneficiary forms in every program, every seminar, every training session. But even with all of that, it's still a big problem. Do you want your retirement savings to go to the wrong people? Or to be heavily taxed? <laughs> Name your IRA or plan beneficiaries on your beneficiary form, not in your will. Your beneficiary form will trump your will. Not updating your beneficiary forms could lead to terrible, unintended consequences, like your children being disinherited. In a U.S. Supreme Court case, after the husband died, his ex-wife ended up getting his 401k, which he wanted to go to their daughter, and his ex-wife agreed to this. But he neglected to update his beneficiary form after their divorce and remove his ex-wife as beneficiary. She ended up in court against her own daughter for over eight years fighting over his $402,000 401k. The ex-wife won the case because she was still listed as the beneficiary. The daughter was disinherited, not to mention the thousands in legal fees. Can you imagine what that did for their mother-daughter relationship? <laughs> in another case, a man's wife died. He had a 401k, and in this case, he was smart, and he did update his 401k beneficiary form to name his three children. But then he made a mistake. He got remarried. <laughs> and she killed him. I mean, I mean he, di <laughs> he died just six weeks later, mysteriously. The new wife of six weeks got it all. How could that be if he updated his beneficiary form to name his children? This is one case where federal plan law trumped the beneficiary form. Under federal law for certain company plans, a spouse is automatically the beneficiary, regardless of who's named on the beneficiary form. The children were disinherited. What should have been done? He should have had his new wife waive her rights to his 401k, but he didn't know to do that. And she walked away with all his money, leaving his children now without their mother or father with nothing. Don't let anything like this happen to you. Life happens, and you need to update your beneficiary forms anytime there are changes, what I call life events. You have a birth, a death, a marriage, a divorce, a remarriage. You had a new grandchild, or maybe there's a new tax law, or you simply change your mind and you want to change beneficiaries. Here's a question I get. Ed, is there still time to fix my beneficiary forms? Yes, but only if you're still breathing. Take a minute, check. So far, most of you are okay. Now to number four, the five biggest retirement roadblocks, not protecting your retirement savings. Are your retirement savings properly insured? You ever think about that? You insure your home, your car, your property, or anything else of value. So what about your retirement savings? What if you get sued? You could have a car accident or somebody gets hurt on your property. If you're liable for big bucks, your homeowner's policy might not be enough, and you could be wiped out, changing everything. Get yourself an umbrella insurance policy for at least a million dollars or more, depending on how much you need to protect. It's an excess liability policy that covers you beyond your current home or auto insurance limits. This is one of the best protections you can have because it covers you for large amounts and it costs very little in relation to that protection. In fact, it's so inexpensive. When I got my last policy, I actually called the insurance company to make sure the bill was right. <laughs> Believe me, I wasn't worried about the insurance company making a profit. I wanted to make sure I had the coverage. You should have it too. Remember that in addition to your retirement savings, which may already be protected under federal law, you have other savings and property to protect. 
you might be one auto accident away from losing it all. Everyone thinks they're great drivers, but let me ask you something. Have you been to Florida? <laughs> Don't look around, just saying. <laughs> Protect your savings and your property. Overlooking this simple detail could instantly turn your world upside down. And now to number five of the five biggest retirement roadblocks, working with the wrong financial advisor. Protecting your retirement savings means knowing the tax rules or working with an advisor who does. You need a specialist. The advisor you have may have made you a ton of money, but what does that mean if you lose it all to taxes on the way out? What I most often hear from those who've seen my public television programs is that their tax planning was never addressed. They say, I wasn't getting this type of information from my current financial advisor my current financial advisor. What does it mean when you say the word current? That's right, maybe you need to make a change for the second half of the game. My rule, if an advisor doesn't invest in their education, then you shouldn't invest with them. They have to earn your business. Let's review the five biggest retirement roadblocks. Number one, not taking care of yourself first. You come first, no detours anymore. Number two, moving your IRA funds the wrong way. Always use direct transfers. Number three, not checking beneficiary forms. Update all of them now. Number four, not protecting your savings. Get an umbrella insurance policy. And number five, working with the wrong financial advisor. Make sure they're educated in the retirement tax rules. And of course, there's the most important sixth retirement roadblock. Not following my roadmap and going off course. <laughs> remember, remember my rules of retirement. Don't lose money in retirement. You need to manage your investments on the way in and manage your taxes on the way out. Your IRA is loaded with taxes. Use it leverage it or lose it to higher taxes. So stuff your tax-free safety zone till it's full and starve your tax-hungry Uncle Sam. It's okay. Remember, he's not even your real uncle. You know that, right? <laughs> Move your money from where? From forever tax to never, never tax. Tax-free tax is always better. That's all you need to know. No more sharing and no more partners. I want you to have more and pay less. The more you plan, the more you keep. Add that to my golden retirement rules. In fact, I'll say it again. The more you plan, the more you keep. You all know of situations where one moment changes everything forever. So you need to do it now. Got it? All right, so there you have it, my retirement roadmap. Now you can stop worrying about not having a plan or running out of money and start seeing your savings grow here in your tax-free safety zone, allowing you to have more, enjoy more, and make it last longer. Now, from my 30-plus years in practice, the three most important things you need to know for building, protecting, and preserving your money. Number one, focus. Focus on what you want to accomplish. What are your biggest concerns? What keeps you up at night? For example, is it running out of money? Is it how much you'll be able to leave for your spouse? Are you worried about high taxes leaving you with less? Focus on what's most important to you and you'll see that all the other pieces will fall into place. Number two, Take the long view. Now that you know what your focus is, don't be short-sighted and go off course. Don't get tripped up by short-term costs. What counts are the results, the big payoff at the end. And number three, take action. Even if you have the perfect, well-thought-out plan, if you don't take action, nothing will happen. So start with small, consistent steps toward your goal and keep forging ahead at the pace that works best for you so you don't get overwhelmed and you stick to your plan. 
small steps lead to big victories in all things. So remember, focus on what's most important to you, take the long view, and take action. The best way to achieve financial success in retirement is to stick to these three core concepts and continue to get educated so you can make better choices, keep more of your money, and make it last longer. I wish you all a happy, healthy, and tax-free retirement. Good luck to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ed Slott, and welcome to my program, How to Check Your Beneficiary Forms, the 10 most important items to check on your IRA and plan beneficiary forms. Check your IRA and plan beneficiary forms. It's critically important. You've heard me say this in every program and every seminar, and it's still an epidemic that could cost you and your family. Use my checklist here and nothing will fall through the cracks. I've seen children disinherited. I've seen ex-wives and ex-husbands walk away with money that was not supposed to go to them. I've seen situations where some children ended up with way more than others when they were all supposed to share equally. I had that last one in my own family, a relative who never thought to ask me for advice, then died and left a mess to clean up. These are all due to IRA and plan beneficiary form mistakes. I don't want this to happen to you or your family. As I always say, life happens and you need to update your beneficiary forms anytime there is a change in your life or with your family. Use my guide to checking your beneficiary forms to make sure everything is correct and current. Here are the 10 most important items to check on your IRA and plan beneficiary forms. Number one, take an account inventory. How many retirement accounts do you have? Make a list and make sure your family has this list. List all your IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, or any other retirement plans you have, or even those you have inherited from others. Locate beneficiary forms for each account. Let your beneficiaries know where this information is and how many accounts you have. If they can't find the beneficiary form, then it's the same thing as not having them. If, like many now, your beneficiary forms are located online or in the cloud where you may have a code to view them, let your family know how to access your beneficiary forms online so they can find them when they need them without having to go to court for access to your online account. As an additional protection, even though it defeats the purpose of cutting down on paper, you should still print out hard copies of your beneficiary forms for each account you have. That's not much paper, but it's important paperwork for your beneficiaries to have access to. Number two, are your beneficiary forms current? Do they take into account life events that would change your choice of beneficiary? By life events, I mean a birth, a death, a marriage, a divorce, a remarriage, beneficiaries to eliminate, marriage of children or grandchildren, children you've adopted, 
the death of a beneficiary, or anything else. See if all the latest events in your life are taken into account when updating your beneficiary forms. You need to have your beneficiary forms updated so they are current, and your beneficiaries need to know where to locate them. Make sure your family has the most up-to-date copy. Make sure any copies at the bank or with your financial advisor are the most up-to-date. Make sure, for example, that they don't have old copies on file that might still list the wrong beneficiary. For example, an ex-spouse or a deceased beneficiary. Number three, have you named both primary and contingent beneficiaries? It's important not only to name primary beneficiaries, but also to name contingent beneficiaries in case a beneficiary dies or wants to disclaim their interest after death. Anytime a beneficiary dies, you should update your beneficiary forms, but sometimes people forget. In that case, if you die without updating your beneficiary form, it might help that you had a contingent beneficiary so that your IRA still goes to the beneficiary of your choice. Have you considered the effect of disclaimers in your planning? Naming contingent beneficiaries is the key to using this strategy. A disclaimer is a right to refuse the inheritance so that your retirement account will pass to your next named beneficiary, which is the contingent beneficiary you named. This is a very effective post-death strategy that allows your beneficiaries more flexibility when they inherit. You might name your spouse as primary beneficiary and your daughter as contingent beneficiary. After you die, your spouse may have other funds and wants her share to go instead to your daughter. She can disclaim her interest in the IRA and the funds will pass to your daughter since she was named as the contingent beneficiary. Disclaiming must generally be done within nine months of death and you cannot accept the funds. If you do, you cannot later disclaim them. Your beneficiaries can disclaim part or all of any inheritance. But this is a legal process. Make sure to use an attorney to do the disclaimer and get tax and legal advice before you do. The point here is to provide a path for a disclaimer after death by naming a contingent beneficiary. If the primary beneficiary disclaims, it can go to the person next in line, a person chosen by you. That's why it's essential to name both primary and contingent beneficiaries on all your plans and IRAs. Even if the beneficiary does not disclaim, if a beneficiary dies before you do, and you don't get to update your beneficiary form before you die, your IRA will still generally pass to your contingent beneficiary. Number four, have you named your beneficiary on your IRA or plan beneficiary form. Don't name your IRA beneficiary in your will. The IRA beneficiary form will trump your will. If you want a person, such as your children or grandchildren, to be your beneficiary, then you must name them on your IRA beneficiary form and not in your will. If you name them in your will and not on your IRA beneficiary form, whoever is named on your IRA beneficiary form will get your IRA, even if it's different than the person you named in your will. But let's say you never filled out your IRA beneficiary form and named your children in your will. Will they still get your IRA? Probably, but why take a chance? Once you name them in your will, you have now turned a non-probate asset into a probate asset. When you name a beneficiary on your IRA or plan beneficiary form, that is a non-probate asset and can't generally be challenged. If you name your child, for example, in your will as your IRA beneficiary, it goes through probate and it can be challenged. Say if other children or people come out of the woodwork and make a claim, say children from a prior marriage. Now there's a legal problem that will have to work its way out through the courts. Not a good scenario for anyone. 
it may be that your children do still inherit your IRA, but look at what you put them through. Even if the correct beneficiaries inherit your IRA through your will, it's still bad. They lose the tax benefits of stretching the inherited IRA out over their lifetime. The only beneficiaries that qualify for the stretch IRA, the ability to take required minimum distributions over their lifetime, are designated beneficiaries. A designated beneficiary is simply a person, an individual named on the IRA or plan beneficiary form. If the beneficiary is not a person, for example, is an estate, a trust, or a charity, then there is no designated beneficiary. Some special trusts can qualify as a designated beneficiary. Number five, do you have a designated beneficiary? A designated beneficiary is an individual who is named on the IRA beneficiary form, not in the will. A designated beneficiary can only be an individual, a person, not an entity like your estate. If the same beneficiary inherits through your will, under the tax law, it's treated as if the estate was the beneficiary. And since the estate is not an individual and has no life expectancy, the inherited IRA will have to be paid out much sooner to your beneficiaries, causing an increased tax bill and diminishing the value of the inherited IRA tax shelter, since it won't be able to last as long. If a non-person inherits your IRA, such as a, an estate or a trust or a charity, they cannot use a life expectancy to stretch post-death distributions because these entities do not have a life expectancy. Only a designated beneficiary can use the stretch IRA to extend distributions over their life expectancy. Does your beneficiary form name a person as opposed to your estate, a charity, or a trust? If not, the beneficiary who does inherit will have to take the IRA funds out much sooner after death. They will follow the distribution rules that apply when you don't have a designated beneficiary. Those rules depend on when the IRA owner dies. If the IRA owner dies before his required beginning date, which is April 1st of the year following the year he turned 70 and a half, then the entire inherited IRA must be withdrawn under the five-year rule. The IRA balance must be emptied by the end of the fifth year after the year of death. That could cause a big tax in a short amount of time if the account was large enough. It's even worse with a Roth IRA. If you die without a designated beneficiary on your Roth IRA, the five-year rule always applies to your beneficiaries who end up receiving your Roth IRA through the will or your estate. If you die without a designated beneficiary and you die after your age 70 and a half required beginning date, then your beneficiaries may do a bit better, but not much. In that case, your beneficiaries still cannot stretch distributions over their lifetimes because they were not named on the IRA beneficiary form they will be stuck taking distributions over your, the deceased IRA owner's, remaining life had you lived. The longest payout possible there would be only 15 years. That's nothing compared to a 30-year-old beneficiary being able to extend distributions out over 50 years. A Roth IRA has no lifetime distributions, so regardless of your age, Whenever you die with a Roth IRA, you have died before the required beginning date, and your beneficiaries will always be stuck with the five-year rule if they're not designated beneficiaries. Remember that these more harsh rules only apply when you die without a designated beneficiary, like when you leave your IRA to your estate. That shouldn't happen. If you neglect to name beneficiaries, your beneficiaries may have a chance to upgrade their status to a designated beneficiary if the financial institution's custodial document, that's the bank's IRA rule book, for example, has a default beneficiary. They have to have a default beneficiary provision. If you neglect to name a beneficiary, they need to know who to pay without a long legal battle. The default beneficiary only comes into play if you don't have a beneficiary named on your IRA beneficiary form. 
The default beneficiary for most financial institutions is your estate if you neglect to name a beneficiary or the beneficiary you name died. If the estate becomes your beneficiary by default, then you won't have a designated beneficiary and your beneficiaries will be stuck with those less favorable distribution rules. Some institutions, though, have defaults that say if there is no beneficiary, then it first goes to your spouse. If no spouse, then to your children. And if no children, then to your estate. So they have two lines of defense set up for you if you neglect to name a beneficiary. In that case, say you named your wife as your IRA beneficiary and wanted your son to be next in line, but you neglected to name him as your contingent beneficiary. If your wife died and you didn't update your beneficiary form and then you died, you would have no beneficiary and the default provision would kick in. If the default was the kind that said, if you have no beneficiary, it's first the spouse, then your children, then your estate, then in that case, since your spouse is already deceased and you have no contingent beneficiary, it will go to your son as the default beneficiary. In that case, your son will be considered a designated beneficiary as if he were named originally on the IRA beneficiary form. But you should never plan hoping that the default beneficiary will bail your family out. If the default in that example was your estate, your son might still inherit, but he won't be a designated beneficiary since the estate was the beneficiary by default. Your son might get the IRA, but would have to follow the less favorable rules that apply when you don't have a designated beneficiary. Also, the IRA would end up going through probate because it first went to your estate. In that example, First, you should have named your son as contingent beneficiary on the beneficiary form. Then, if your wife died, your son would automatically move up as primary beneficiary without you doing anything. But even if you named your wife as your beneficiary and your son as contingent on your IRA beneficiary form, once your wife died, you should still immediately name your son as primary beneficiary and name a new contingent beneficiary. And that brings us to number six. Has a beneficiary of yours died? Then you need to update your beneficiary form. Anytime a beneficiary dies, the beneficiary form needs to be updated, naming both primary and contingent beneficiaries. This ensures that the people you want to inherit your IRA will inherit it with no legal problems and with the best tax advantages. The same thing after a divorce. You need to update your beneficiary form to remove your ex-spouse who will probably inherit if you don't correct this. Number seven, will you need to name a trust as your IRA or plan beneficiary? If you'll be naming a trust as your beneficiary, make sure that the trust is named on the IRA beneficiary form. This is another common mistake. Some people erroneously believe that having the trust automatically takes care of that. No, it doesn't. If you don't name the trust on your IRA beneficiary form, some bad things can happen. First, your IRA might go to the wrong people, and all the time and money you spent creating the trust will be wasted, since your IRA will never get there. Chances are that if you are naming a trust as your IRA beneficiary, then you probably have a sizable IRA you want to protect. And without a beneficiary form naming the trust, none of your intended plan will come to pass. Number eight, do you want to leave any of your IRA to a charity? If yes, then the charity has to be named on the IRA beneficiary form. Another important tip here. If you are naming a charity as a beneficiary for a portion of your IRA and say your children for the rest, then it's best to split your IRA into two IRAs, naming the charity on the part you want to go to them and name your children on the part you want to go to them. This is not a requirement. 
This is just some practical advice from my years of experience. You generally don't want to mix different types of beneficiaries like a charity and children on one IRA. It will be much smoother after death if the IRAs are separate. If not, the account will have to be split after death, which is probably no problem. But if there is a delay or other problems and the post-death split is not done in time, by the end of the year after death, then the children will not get the tax advantages of stretching the IRA. They will not be designated beneficiaries if the inherited IRA is not timely split after death. Also, if there is a problem with the percentage each beneficiary is to receive, or it's not clear, you can avoid that possibility by naming the charity and your children each as 100% beneficiary on your separate IRAs. The same thing goes for spouses and non-spouses. If you're naming both your spouse and a non-spouse, like a child, as your IRA beneficiaries, each for a portion of your IRA, then the same practical advice applies. Use separate IRAs, one for your spouse and one for your children. The spouse is entitled to certain advantages, like a spousal rollover that your non-spouse beneficiaries are not entitled to. But to get those advantages, your spouse must be the sole beneficiary. It would be easier to have your spouse named as the sole beneficiary on a separate IRA for the portion you want to leave that spouse. Then have your children be the beneficiaries on a separate IRA for them. This way, it's nice and clean after death. Like the charity example, though, this is not required because the inherited account can be split after death and the spouse can still be considered the sole beneficiary of his or her share. But once again, what if for some reason there is a family feud or other legal delays? As a practical tip, split your IRA into two separate IRAs and name your spouse for his or her share on one and name your children on the other IRA for their share. Then go one step further and name contingent beneficiaries on each of those IRAs. The children can be the contingent beneficiary on the IRA you are leaving your spouse. On the IRA you're leaving to your children, you might want to name their spouses or children as contingent beneficiaries, so their share goes to their families. Generally, it's best not to mix different types of beneficiaries. What if your beneficiaries are all children? then that's okay to put them together as co-beneficiaries of your IRA since they're the same type of beneficiaries, all non-spouse beneficiaries who'll generally follow the same distribution rules after death. Number nine, are there multiple beneficiaries? Check the percentages. If you do name several beneficiaries, like your three children as co-beneficiaries on your IRA, which is very common and fine, Make sure you are clear as to how much each is to receive with either a fraction, a percentage, or the word equally or in equal shares if that applies. I just had a case where three children were named on the beneficiary form with no statement as to how much they would each receive. No fraction, no percentage, nothing. In the IRA owner's will, he said he wanted each of them to share equally, but it didn't say that on the beneficiary form. Because of the way the children were listed, the bank treated only the first child named as the beneficiary and all the others as contingent. That was obviously not what their father wanted, but now they were stuck with a mess. We were able to fix this with gifts and disclaimers to equalize this as best we could, but it was a real mess. Luckily for this family, the child who was listed first and could have walked away with the entire IRA with the bank's blessing did not want to do that. She chose instead to do whatever possible to honor what she knew her father's wishes were even though he made the mistake of not including that critical information on the IRA beneficiary form he filled out. Here's another point on naming multiple beneficiaries. If you do enter the shares they each get, do they add up to 100%? 
check the math. I found mistakes here. If you want your children to share equally, then just say equally as co-primary beneficiaries. So it's clear that they are each a primary beneficiary for an equal share. If there are percentages, make sure those add up to 100%. Are there multiple contingent beneficiaries? Who are the contingent beneficiaries? Do their percentages add up to 100%? Item 10, check to see if your beneficiary form allows a per stirpes option so that if your beneficiary dies before you, that beneficiary's share will go to his or her children and not to other beneficiaries. However, if you are following my advice here, when a beneficiary dies, you should replace that beneficiary with a new beneficiary. That will avoid the problem of who gets a deceased child's share if that child dies before you do. If that child dies before you do, then obviously you are still alive to update your beneficiary form to avoid these potential family legal problems. That's my 10 most important items to check on your beneficiary forms. And here is an extra piece of advice for your beneficiaries. Do your beneficiaries know to also name beneficiaries when they inherit? Make sure also to inform your beneficiaries to name their own beneficiaries when they inherit, so their remaining share will go to the right people chosen by them and not a legal process. The beneficiary's beneficiary is called the successor beneficiary. Well, those are the 10 most critical items to check on your IRA or company plan beneficiary forms. Make sure you go through this with your family and keep your beneficiary forms for all your IRA and company retirement plans correct and up to date and in a place where they can be found after your death. This will resolve lots of problems later on. You have a great list here and with lots of good practical advice. But it's only good if you use it, and I hope you do. Thank you very much. Good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.